dear Professor Snower, dear Professor. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Dear, dear Professor Hordic, um, dear Marcus Engels, thanks for the introduction, even though I missed part of it. And um, also a big thanks to the Think7 organizers, the Global Solutions Initiative, and the German Development Institute um, for your kind invitation. And obviously to all the T7 delegates and contributors for, for welcoming me here today. Um, this event is part of our dialogue with the civil society and this kind of dialogue has become part of the G7 process as a whole and for Germany in particular. Um, the G7 presidency reaches out to NGOs, to trade unions, to the business sector, women, youth and in this year also to the thinkers, to all of you. And, um, I'm happy to shed some light on what are the priorities for the G7 presidency of Germany this year and also for the prospects of the summit that will take place in Schloss Elmau later next month. Um, as you all know, the Chancellor will be happy to seeing some of you on Wednesday um, to then officially receive and further discuss the Think7 recommendations. Um, you might have heard that he is unavailable today because he is in Africa um, after visiting um, Senegal. Um, he's now in Niger and will go to South Africa. And this is important because meanwhile, the whole of Europe and NATO members are at the moment concentrating on Russia's war against Ukraine, um, the rest of the world remains important. And it is also important that we take a look at what is happening in the rest of the world. Um, when we take a look at this new world order that might take place and that we see emerge, we need to be careful that this new world is not separated in the G7 at one hand and the BRICS plus um, on the other side. And if we look at what is discussed in developing countries and in emerging market societies, then it is high energy prices and high food prices that hit poorer countries especially and much harder than they hit us. Um, so for us and for the Chancellor, it is important to signal to these countries that we will not leave them alone in dealing with the problem. Um, that is why Germany, for example, just announced to contribute 430 million euro to fight the food crisis and to make sure that food security takes place. And that is why, and Professor Snower mentioned that Chancellor Scholz decided to invite Indonesia as the G20 presidency, India as the upcoming G20 presidency, Senegal as the head of the African Union, and South Africa to take part in the G7 as invited guests because we all know that these countries play a crucial role in shaping the new world order. The challenges that face our world are reflected in your T7 summit theme, fostering global cooperation in a contested geopolitical environment. A contested geopolitical and that's nicely put, I would say. Um, we see that new centers of power, new alliances and new rivalries are emerging, some of them putting pressure on our democratic institution and our values. And with a view to Russia's attack on Ukraine, even threatening our rules-based international order and ultimately global peace and also European peace. 
It is important to state that Russia's war of aggression is still raging in Ukraine and every day bringing loss and damage to Ukrainian people and severe repercussions to the regions and to the world when we look at food and energy. Um, in that regard, your summit theme is not just timely, but also relevant. Fostering global cooperation, that is indeed needed. And we've seen this kind of global cooperation, at least in the Western part of the world, when we look at the European Union, when we look at NATO and when we look at the G7, but also when we look at the General Assembly of the United Nations, where 140 or 141 countries stood together in condemning Russia's aggression. And what we saw in the last months is strong signals of solidarity um, with Ukraine and unity in our responses to that war, um, but also strong signals that the rest of the world, emerging and developing countries, are not forgotten. Um, if I look at the SYNC 7 process and your response, I see that you've joined forces with Women 7, with U7, and the Aspen Institute to issue a clear statement condemning Russia's unprovoked invasion, and I really much welcome that. Um, and the social and economic repercussions of that war are also reflected in today's summit program. I'm very grateful for that input, and it is pretty clear that we cannot pursue business as usual um, in times like these. And so it's a good it's good to know that we have the T7 on our side here. So thank you very much. For the G7, um, the opportunities for multilateral and geopolitical cooperation are expanding um, in a world that will be home to 8 million people by next year. Our actions will only gain traction if we stand together as the G7 with our international partners, guided by common values, interests, and commitments. The Russian war on Ukraine has had and will have significant impact on the G7 priorities and the agenda process, reflecting the major global implication it is having. And you could see that um, when we started discussing the G7 priorities, you could say there was other emphasis, but then the war changed many things. Um, with the other G7 countries, we have fine-tuned our priorities ahead of the G7 Leaders Summit at the end of June. Um, we have put an enhanced focus on food security, on energy security, on resilient supply chains, and on disinformation, and obviously the short and long-term financial support to Ukraine will also play a role, as will the sanctions, coordination, and the outreach. But as I said, the G7 Elmau summit also coincides with a period of profound global change, events that prompted us to draw attention on as you put it, progress towards an equitable world, the motto of our G7 presidency. Um, progress towards an equitable world is indeed more important than ever. For as dramatic and tragic as the Russian war of aggression against Ukraine is, it must not lead us to neglect our responsibility for long-term global transformation and challenges. And that is why we said there is five core areas that we want to tackle with our G7 presidency. First is a sustainable planet. Um, and that means especially to deal with climate change. And I will come to that in a second. The second one is economic stability and transformation, also especially after 
um, the heavy impact the COVID pandemic had on the international financial system and of many economies, uh, economies um, all over the world. The third one is healthy lives, also an outcome of the global pandemic. The fourth one is investment in a better future, a theme that is carried on by the G7 um, since many, many um, years. And the last one, and one that was important for me, is unity and being stronger together in defending our liberal democracies. Um, and this has something to do, especially with the internet, and the question whether our open and free democracies are under attack by enemies that use the technologies developed in G7 countries to undermine democracy and free speech in our countries. Mm -hmm. So these five core areas um, will be tackled at the G7. Um, Olaf Scholz wanted to make that summit again a little bit what it was in the beginning when Helmut Schmidt and Giscard d'Estaing um, develop it, um, a gathering, the fireside, where world leaders would really discuss world issues. Um, to be honest and fair, I think this whole thing has emerged into something way bigger, not only with the outreach process, which is positive, but especially into something where there's a danger also with too many others invited that world leaders read out pre-written written notes to each other and not really engaging into a discussion, an open exchange in what is going on and what needs to be tackled. And what we will try with this gathering in Schloss Elmau is that we return to that old idea of a real exchange. And I think the time is exactly right to doing that because there's so many uncertainties now because of the war and because that one member of the international community decided to leave rules-based order and to put might before right. Maybe you allow me to talk about two of the core areas that I mentioned and to highlight them because they're of special importance. And that would be food security at one hand and um, climate change on the other. Um, in my opinion, G7 has demonstrated in the two areas that they're able to act quickly and swiftly, um, also in regard to Russia's war. So on food security, um, it is important for developing countries that donors and organizations act quickly and with foresight in a coordinated matter. And to aim for stronger coordination of the G7 and the international organizations and other donors in the fight against the food crisis, our goal is to form a global alliance for food security. And as always, there's a nice acronym, GAF. Um, I would say there is already a great willingness, as demonstrated at the finance minister's G7 meeting, but also the spring meeting of the IMF and the World Bank, to help on the part of many countries. As mentioned, Germany alone has pledged 430 million, in addition, obviously, to the regular um, money that the development ministry is contributing. Um, we need to do more, and I hope that we will see some progress at the, at the meeting. This um, global alliance of food security will be mo modeled after COVAX, the initiative and that we founded um, during the COVID, uh, COVID um, pandemic and that helped in um, financing vaccines, um, diagnostics and therapeutics for the world. 
The second one is climate change. You know that Germany and the German government, the new government has put an emphasis on that. And um, this is also reflected on our priorities for the G7 summit. The main idea that Olaf Scholz is proposing to his fellow world leaders is one that he already developed as finance minister and kicked it around and with his colleagues of the G7 and the G20 finance ministers and many said that's a good idea. And that is the idea of a climate club, not a club in the Washingtonian or London um, style, members only, invitation only, um, and big requirements for attending, but an inclusive and open club. And why is that needed? Well, as many countries are introducing carbon pricing, we see a danger that carbon leakage happens so that production does not take place in those countries with, with a higher carbon price, but they are shifted to other countries. What's the reaction on that then? A carbon border adjustment mechanism as discussed in the European Union to prevent that carbon leakage. But what happens if Europe is to where to install a CBAM and then Canada and then other places in the world? Well, in five years, in 10 years time, we would have trade tensions or even trade wars and countries suing each other at the WTO um, because there's difference between one CBAM and another and tariffs are imposed. So the idea is to form a club where the different models of reducing CO2 with implicit or direct carbon pricing can be made comparable and so that we avoid this kind of trade war that might emerge. And this obviously needs to be an open and inclusive club so that everybody that has something to do with reducing carbon emissions can join and make these different efforts comparable. This kind of action will not be enough for the carbon club or the climate club, but we also need to agree on, and that will be the second pillar of that climate club, on industrial transformation. And um, there we will look into the different sectors and work together on standards. So, for example, the question, what actually is green hydrogen? Do we talk about the same thing when we talk about green hydrogen? And the third element is especially important for developing and emerging country markets, um, and that is uh, the outrage through country, part country partnerships, like the Just Energy Transition Partnerships. One is already in place with South Africa, and we're discussing others with um, India, Indonesia, Senegal, and Vietnam. And we hope that we can make progress, real progress at um, the summit in Elmau on all three pillars. Um, you, the T7, um, also address these two issues, in particular in the context of strengthening the multilateral order and the need for a capable G20 format and the opportunities plurilateral alliances may offer. And it's no wonder that I think that you're right. Um, we want an open cooperation with all partners, so it's not limited to the G7. It should include the G20, and that is why Indonesia and India are taking part. And as you can imagine, we support the Indonesian G20 presidency. This is always going hand in hand, G7 and G20. And that is why we are in close cooperation um, with the Indonesian presidency. Um, there's many questions. Um, Russian war puts um, pressure also on Indonesia. I think it was a good idea to invite President Zelensky to the meeting in Bali but we all know how difficult it will be 
um, with Russia being part of the G20 as well. And I'm, I, I can foresee controversies arising from that. Um, I'm very happy that T7 is now part of this process. I've known Marcus Engels and Professor Snorr for quite a while. I've followed the work of the Global Solutions Initiative. I think it's a valued contribution. We saw at the G20 presidency in Hamburg um, in, in 2017. And I'm very happy that we were able to continue that cooperation and now with the other institution being present as well. I'd like again to thank all of you for your contributions. I've at least read the communique, not every single paper, I'm very sorry, um, but I was um, very pleased about the broads of um, what you discussed, and I'm very happy that um, we see delegations, for example, from Japan um, and from many think tanks and organizations participating in that process. So I'm very much looking forward to the discussion with you from, for your input. And um, I'm pretty certain that Olaf Scholz feels the same when he will meet the delegation of your leaders on Wednesday. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Minister Schmidt. Maybe you join us here for, please just take, take a seat. Thank you very much for, for, for this um, uh, keynote and for your um, take on the summit, um, on the deliberations, on the invitees um, and the careful considerations of moving also um, beyond the written speeches. No? moving beyond what has been prepared by the apparatuses and into um, the yeah encouraging the the leaders to to sort of bring in their own voices um, now can i kickstart the discussion by inviting you to say a little more uh, pinpoint what would be the successes of a successful summit you have mentioned the, some of the decisions that are being prepared in the field of um, climate change, climate clubs, as well as in the field um, um, with regard to the food crisis, the looming food crisis. Um, but maybe you can go beyond these ones and, and pinpoint a little more what, what would you expect with regard to also um, the view onto the G20 summit? Well. Obviously, the first one will be strengthening unity in regard to the Ukrainian crisis and Russia's war. So to continue what we've seen, that unity within the G7 when it comes to sanctions, but also when it comes to military supporting with, with equipment Ukraine in its fight against this unlawful invasion. But I think equally important is that the G7 should not focus only on Ukraine, but keep the rest of the world uh, in mind as well. So when it comes to food, when it comes to, to energy prices, and also on the debt situation um, after three years of COVID now, or two and a half years of COVID, we know how difficult the situation for many countries is when it comes to a high debt level and debt sustainability. Um, and then obviously, for us, really important is this climate club, so I have to mention it again, because I would like to see progress there so that it is endorsed as, um, as an aim that, that the G7, but hopefully then the G20 will work on. Um, and then this whole notion of, of food security, um, I think is very, very urgent because we see it at the horizon and my experience from from the finance track at the g7 is that that many are pretty exhausted after this two and a half year fight against covid also on the economic side the impact it has um, we have discussed endlessly at the imf and with the world bank we have mobilized this sdr allocation of 650 billion um, we have mobilized internal in the, in, the, in the G7 countries, but in many G20 countries, 
um, resources to fight COVID. And now comes the next big crisis. Um, and so my fear is that this exhaustion will take place. And so I hope that we can, despite all the difficulties, that we will have the discussions that, and that and that G7 members live up to the expectations that exist. You have alluded to the need for the G7 and the G20 to cooperate closely. And in this um, troubled world, many feel that we are thereby in the process of creating a new foundation for global cooperation and the plurilateral values that uh, and alliances that you alluded to are a step in that direction and the basic message that i've understood is that the first best is obviously global multilateral cooperation for global problems but where that's not possible these plurilateral alliances will be an important driving force so my question is with regard to how the G7 can support the G20, can this idea of climate clubs be extended to, uh, oh, this is bad, uh, health club doesn't sound right, um, but health alliance, but also digital alliance where democratization of the internet uh, can be introduced among plurilateral uh, you've already alluded to a food alliance um, our economic alliances that uh, help countries develop universal basic uh, services and protections possible how broad uh, is this new vision that you have propounded well i definitely see possibilities um, for this kind of cooperation. And if I look back at, uh, again, the finance track, I see that the G7 was the starting point for, for example, the global minimum tax and, and the idea of um, a redistribution of tax revenues. Um, it then was discussed and endorsed by the G20 and then uh, later on carried out by the so-called inclusive framework of the OECD with, with nearly 140 countries. Um, and if you look at, at not the health club um, and not a gym, but uh, an initiative to, to, to bring vaccine justice um, to the world, this initiative COVAX started also at the G20 and obviously G7 countries feel a strong responsibility. And when it comes to climate finance, that will be another issue obviously on the table also ahead of COP27, um, then the G7 play a crucial role together then with the, with the G20. Um, I'm, I'm not so sure, I think, and that's, I think what you also discussed and where, where input and, and fresh thinking is, is needed, we are at, at a turning point. Now all the institution that we've known somehow with this aggression and this bluntly rejection of international law, in my opinion, have come to an end. And the, the question remains, what will and how will the new world order look like? Um, I'm pretty much in favor of preserving the G20, um, but obviously it is a problem that one member of that club of the G20 is, is not adhering to international laws and any rules any longer. And so how to include such a member um, is a difficult question. And the same is true for the United Nations and, and where you have one of the P5 not respecting the fundamental rules of the United Nation. And my fear is a fragmentation of the world where we see and if, if the G7 um, does not take it and, and, and acts very in a very cautious way, taking into consideration the rest of the world, that we will at the end have a G7 on the one side with all these beautiful values and arguing for democracy and 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 then we are pushing others into 
a BRICS plus world, and we have a clear split. And that is why, for example, Chancellor Scholz um, went to Africa now to reach out to the African Union or to the G20 member from Africa, South Africa, to engage and make, make sure that it's not the West dealing with this problem against Russia, um, but that we take into consideration all these things that are going on on, on, on the global level and on the global south. And I think we are still at this, at this moment in history where we have to think about the future um, design of, 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 of international um, organization and global order. And, and many of the truths of the past are gone. Minister, I would like to come in with one more question and then open it to the public. So please uh, feel invited, encouraged to come in. Um, well, the, well, facing all these multiple crises is of, of course um, a challenge to policymaking and just as much beyond. Uh, you've already alluded to the aspect that um, the state level is tasked, of course, but all other societal levels are equally tasked. Um, and um, continuity um, from one presidency to the next, from one engagement group process to the next is, um, is a challenge. So maybe you could say a few more words on what would you expect from the engagement groups also beyond basically the submission of a communique? Well, first of all, I think it's 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 a beautiful invention that these outreaches and the engagement processes exist, and I've witnessed that personally in Hamburg at the at the G20 process when I was in Hamburg, kind of responsible for for the G20, and I wanted, for example, to have the C20 taking place in Hamburg because. Um, I found it important that it's not only world leaders that meet on these occasions, but that the civil society and, and other sectors are equally involved, so that it's not something only that the powerful are meeting. Um, and we all know how important civil society and independent think tanks and, and science institutions are. Um, I would say that it's even more important in the G20 um, context where it's not a club of democracies with shared values all over but we have different traditions there and that think tanks are allowed and and that critical voices are heard and are part of the process i think is is very important I don't see that in the G7 uh, there is an imminent danger that these voices are excluded, but we've seen some tendencies now that that facts are not valued any longer, that alternative facts take place. And so for me, this this whole idea of of reaching out and in including all the different um, partners is quite important. And as far as I saw it, this um moving from one presidency to the other because it's 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 not an organization neither g7 nor g20 so basically every country starts all over again so it's also i think a good idea to have some continuity um with the engagement processes and that um people um, work together for quite a while and can accompany the, 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 the official, the leaders processes and, and give input. And it is equally important within our societies as, as, as with the groups that there is this exchange. And my feeling from my experience in government is, and especially during COVID, it was quite important to have the exchange, for example, with um, many economists um, to keep up an open mind. And, and it is equally important for thinkers um, to understand the parameters under which governments operate um, so that the advice they give actually helps um, and is not seen as something, oh, these thinkers, they're so 
in their own world and do not have anything to do with which the government is dealing with. And obviously it's also helpful for governments to get fresh ideas because um, once you're in a crisis and in a process and, and dealing with the daily task, somehow it's difficult to keep this, um, this strategic vision at one side, but also to have fresh ideas on what is occurring. And so if, if, if managed in a good way and with understanding from both sides, these processes can really improve um, the society's and governmental response to crises or situations. So that's, that's the expectations. And so far, I've seen that it's working quite well. Thank you, Minister, um, also for pushing us a little um, and, and encouraging us to reflect also on quality assurance, I also heard, uh, within, within the process. Now, I've seen several hands up, um, also from um, uh, India, um, Japan, I see, uh, UK, I see. So let's, let's maybe start here with India, Professor. Thanks, thanks. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thanks, uh, Honorable Minister, for uh, joining us this morning, and uh, congratulations to DIE and Global Solutions for getting all of us here together at FES. Uh, Minister, I'm quite impressed with uh, uh, the idea that you have just shared with us in terms of taking everyone along. And I'm reminded of uh, my visit earlier in Berlin in 2007, I suppose, uh, when the Halligan Dem process was being discussed. And, uh, and I think uh, uh, the efforts that have gone in since then by DIE and, uh, and uh, uh, through their program called Managing Global Governance, MGG program, which became one of the flagship programs of the government of Germany. I think the effort has been there in terms of uh, reaching out to BRICS, the, the Outreach 5 or things like that. But what we have seen subsequently is non-institutionalization of that process. And, and, and even just now we heard uh, Professor Snow saying that G7 should support G20. So you see a sort of effort in terms of, uh, yes, we are on the table, you can also come. So that approach in a way sometimes undermines the split with which things are launched and initiated. Uh, I am uh, uh, heading a think tank in New Delhi and uh, would be part of India's T20 initiative next year uh, our institution would be the lead uh, institution for uh, for the T20 process. I'm also on the uh, board of governors of the Central Bank of India. So we are seeing a sort of effort both in terms of how the norms are adopted. And as you very rightly said, that there are countries which are now converging with value systems. And, and your emphasis on value is extremely important because that's where others are getting completely sidelined. So how we can think of a system where the countries with common faith in values, they come together and not the ongoing processes which are in any case polarized. I have been working on, on, on South and South-South-led cooperation, but I'm realizing that within South, there is a crack coming in. There is a, a set of countries which do not believe in the same value system that we stood for all this while. So the divide in the South and divide in the North is very clear. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Chaturvedi, and we will collect one more, if we may. And we go to Professor Tetsuchi. Thank you, Anna Katarina. My name is Tetsuchi Sonobe. I'm the Dean of the Asian Development Bank Institute, the think tank of Tokyo-based think tank of uh, Asian Development Bank. Uh, it's an absolute honor and pleasure to be here and uh, ask you a question, uh, Honorable Minister. So we greatly appreciate the German uh, G7 presidency championing the policy agenda for sustainable economic recovery at the global level. However, buy-in from the developing and the emerging market countries uh, will be a requirement for a successful outcome. So it's invite, uh, important to invite Indonesia and India, and it's important to visit South, uh, West Africa. But uh, beyond such gestures, 
so I'd like to ask, uh, what can and will the G7 do to foster the <laughs> truly global sense of ownership uh, on the common policy challenge ahead, especially in the current geopolitical uh, polarization? So as the Asian Development Bank Institute is planning to host uh, T7 next year, as a part of the Japan's uh, G20-2030 presidency, I'd like to seek your advice on how, to, uh, how we could support the G7 uh, effort uh, building on the results of the uh, Germany's uh, presidency. Thank you very much. Thank you, and over to you, Minister. Yeah, th thank you very much um, for these two very interesting contributions and, and also questions. Um, I think um, on, the, on the polarization, I mean, we hear a lot that it is democracies where there's autocracies. Um, I'm not so sure whether this is the right framing. Um, I would rather say it's those who stick to the good old rule of law, where there's, and this is basically one country and maybe the five or six that voted with them, um, that think that, that the, this old rule of law thing is, is, is over and that um, imperialism and neo-colonialism is back. And there is a right to just invade a country and redraw borders that have been there for for, cent for all at, le at least decades. And, and in that, with this approach, we can broaden the alliance and do not make it into the West or a smaller group against then, and this would be more inclusive. Um, Obviously, if, if we look at China, no, to mention the elephant in the room, um, it is also important not to push them into a coalition with Russia and to make sure to discuss with them, look, you are oh, and oh, has, have always been in favor for um, territorial integrity and non-intervention um, and so how can you support a country that breaches all these principles that you've been standing for um, and by that making this alliance broader um, and i think this would be one of of the elements where i would say the line should be so be careful not to be too limited in whom we include in our values-based approach. Nevertheless, obviously, there is this, the former minister of, 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 of foreign affairs of the last German government formed this alliance for multilateralism. I think that's maybe a good thing to play around with so that we look for partners that would like to strengthen multilateralism in these difficult times. No, and as I mentioned, um, the global minimum tax, that was for me in the last year, one of these shining examples that multilateralism actually can work. And, and many said when we had this discussion here and people started to discuss about digital services taxes in different European countries. And when now Chancellor Scholz as finance minister came up with this idea of a global minimum tax, everybody was saying, yeah, global minimum tax, international agreement, forget it. No, to bring together 140 countries will never happen. And, and, and here we are three years later, and it actually exists as an agreement of 136 countries. And, and, and maybe this climate club can be a next element of that kind of cooperation. And, and so if, if, if the Indian um, G20 presidency and also you as the think tankers can help identifying parts of, corpor of, of, of cooperation 
um, where such um, things can be achieved, that, that would help. Because my fear really is that with this war, we see new cracks in the international community and we need to look for, for more common ground now. And, and I think this is, this is also um, the same would go um, for, for the um, T7 um, that, that you will um, host with the, with the G7 presidency of, of Japan next year. I find it difficult to say, okay, do this and that and that. You, you should ask your colleagues from the, from the German T7 process, because I do respect that it's separate things, um, what the civil society, what think tankers can do and, and what we as governments can do. But from the receiving end, I can only tell you, it's good, especially in these times of crises where there is no certainties any longer it's good to have this 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 input no and and what you said about um the sustainable global recovery and and economy yeah this is where where you the think tankers have a lot to say and and to contribute so i would only like to encourage you to continue this good cooperation in the in the think seven and and the think 20 as well in cooperation with the indian colleagues then now, Minister, we have six more hands up and many more hands up. So I already apologize in advance if we can't if we can't hear all of you. I would like to now um, move over to um, Peter Taylor uh, and then from Peter over um, to his neighbor uh, directly. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Peter Taylor from the Institute of Development Studies in the UK. And thank you, Honourable Minister and Professor Snower and Hornish for giving us a very inspiring start. Um, clearly, the Global Solutions uh, and the Think7 Summit is focused on many issues. And thank you for raising particularly the priorities around food security and, and climate change. Uh, of course, we understand from the experience of the COVID-19 pandemic that if we want to be ready and prepared for future pandemics, which are almost certain, we'll need a joined up evidence-based approach to global health. Of course, there's a slight danger that we want to move on from the pandemic uh, and move on to a, a different future, but at the same time, we may not learn the lessons uh, sufficiently. So we're going to need a serious commitment to establishing a global research and knowledge infrastructure. Um, perhaps similar fashion to the Global Alliance on Food Security and the Climate Club, perhaps not a health club, as uh, Professor Snower said, but would the G7, with support from Germany in particular, be willing to help launch a decade for global health to really help catalyze progress in this direction and to ensure that we continue to learn lessons from the way we approach the pandemic? Thank you. Thank you. And colleague, thank you. Uh, thank you. Good morning to everybody. I'm Deb Deb Bhattacharya, coming from Center for Policy Dialogue, CPD, Dhaka, Bangladesh. Uh, a country which is neither a member of G7 nor of the G20. So the, the point I wanted to raise being inspired by the minister's talk about the inclusivity and an openness and having a shared value for stability, peace and resilience. I was just wondering that the quite often the values are shared, but the interpretations are not. The experiences are different of the same value at their put in practice. So the question is that the narrative which we are now putting together from G7 and maybe a broader section of the United Nations membership really does not bring into its fold at least a quarter of the UN membership who are neither a member of the seven nor of the 20. They are a member of the 193. So the issue is why they are sharing the value but not aligning himself, themselves with this particular narrative based on their concerns and experience. They are not only interested, they're equally victim of the fallouts of the war and the global recovery and everything else. So they are, equal, they are worried about the prospect, but they're also wanting to revisit doing, do a retrospect. To what extent this approach of yours includes a historical retrospect? Thank you. We take one more. Yeah, sure. yeah. 
One more, yeah, please. Female colleague. Thank you very much. I'm Ronja Scheler from Kerber Stiftung in, in Berlin. Um, thank you very much for emphasizing all this um, inclusivity and in the, the outreach that um, the, the G7 will have to do to the rest of the world. But in a way, I think you're, you're preaching to the converted here in this room. And I wanted to ask you, if you look into the more sort of classical foreign policy security communities, there is so much talk about reinforcing the West, strengthening the transatlantic alliance, etc. And also, if I speak with colleagues from the United States, it's, it's so much about just balancing against China and bringing together like-minded states in that regard. And I would be interested in your thought on how we can bridge these gaps, like what, what can Germany do within the G7, but also beyond to bridges, but perhaps also what can we as, as the thinkers community do? in that regard. Thank you. Thanks. Vanessa. Yeah, maybe I start with the last question. I think w one way of doing that is putting it on the agenda and and not forgetting about it. Um, and, and that was especially important for Chancellor Scholz um, to talk about these issues. And also, if you look at um, his public appearances, um, he always made sure to include these questions as well and not limit himself to military aid to Ukraine, strengthening NATO, fostering the transatlantic alliance, or making the European Union um, stronger. Um, and, and you're right, there is a tendency, especially um, in this sphere of thinkers on, on security and foreign policy, to exclude these other questions. and. I think what we should have learned from the global health crisis um, and the pandemic is that, that, that there are issues like climate change and like food security that, that can't um, be ignored and shouldn't be. And so also for think tankers, it is important um, to raise these questions. And if you look at the Munich Security Conference, how it has developed, um, I think it was pretty good that in in 2020 they put global health on the agenda um, and I do remember that few people attended uh, the sessions in Munich on global health and half a month later um, it was the big thing and since then special sessions and virtual conferences have taken place also um, in the framework of the of the Munich Security Conference, that everybody understands that a global health is also a security issue, and so that's something that that I find very important also in understanding what is going on sometimes in the internal German debate, but I see it with with others as well. Our journalist friends have a tendency to reduce the complexity of the issue because it's easier than if you reduce complexity um, to write an article and an op-ed and to have a strong opinion of Germany is acting too slow, we should deliver more weapons or other weapons. It's, it's easily said, but you as think tankers and we as politicians, we know that complexity is a reality and we have to live with complexity. And if we were to start to reduce complexity, we would make a horrible mistake. Um, then it's easy to, to write an op-ed on that reduced complexity, but you're ignoring lots of issues and, and the interdependence of these things need to be understood and embraced, both by thinkers and, and by politicians. Um, so on, on, on Peter's point on, on, on the preparedness um, um, and, and, and the lessons learned, I com I'm completely with you. And obviously in the finance track, I was the deputy for the G7 and G20. We've been dealing with that the whole time. My fear is um, that indeed now focus is shifting and that we're making the same mistakes that we made in the past. Um, my hope is that all those who are at the table learned the lesson and, and I see like 
the high level committee and and the different um elements that were introduced both by the g7 and the g20 um to 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 find finance and to to understand that preparedness is an issue look at what we have here in germany now a a who um, hub for innovation so i hope that these elements will be maintained my my fear indeed is that there's so many things that need to be done and obviously after nearly three years of COVID, financial means also in developing countries um in developed countries are exhausted um that there is a feeling okay we need to prioritize um and and now food security and and energy prices needs to be tackled uh, and COVID is gone and 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 other infectious diseases um but again i'm i'm more part of the working group of optimists in politics so i think um that that leaders won't forget and that is why it is also one of the five core things on our agenda and i hope we can see progress there and the colleague from Bangladesh, yeah, this is, I mean, when we were discussing G20 and, and, and when, whatever it is uh, representative and whether this is okay to have such a club, um, you have a lot of criticism of those who are not included. Um, and that is why it is so important, and also for the G7, this is even more true, um, to have the outreach process happening. Um, and so that is why the Chancellor made sure that he invited um, Senegal as the presidency of the African Union, so that there is a representation um, of countries that normally are not at the table um, of the G20 or the G7. Um, but it remains important to to strengthen the existing institutions in the different sectors like the FAO or the WHO that deal with certain aspects and that are representative institutions. At the end, the G7 or the G20 are kind of clubs of, um, of, of, of countries um, that voluntarily work together. That's the flaw of that format, but also the advantage. Um, and having participated in many G20 meetings now, um, I would say the challenge for the G20 is to overcome this leaders reading pre-written statements to each other. And the bigger the audience, the, 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 the more complicated it is um, to overcome this. And I can tell you this is pretty useless. Then the, the side, the talks at the sidelines are the important event and the bilateral meetings. Um, so it's a kind of a speed dating um, thing taking place in one, at one summit. Um, but, but this is the problem of the United Nations. No, even at UNGA, you don't have all the leaders together discuss world problems. Um, and so I think it's, it's, it's always, there's always a trade-off between representation and effectiveness and, and really being able to tackle the questions. So I fear there's no good answer to, to, to your question. Minister, we have to, uh, with a look onto the time, basically, have to come to an end. I would like to thank you for joining us here today. Um, we would like to thank you. I hear a strong plea from your side for multilateralism and for working also with positive examples. You referred to the global minimum tax as one of those examples to, to enable also the communication of what multilateralism can bring. I also hear a strong um, plea from your side for um, not reducing complexity and in order to not to do this, um, uh, link basically in state and non-state approaches to governance and to steering mechanisms. And I hear a strong uh, encouragement from your side for fostering continuity in the engagement group processes beyond this one presidency. That's, I think, what we are aiming for. 
and will also work towards in the coming two days. So thank you very much. If I could um, just uh, go into one other thing that I heard that I think will be terribly important in the world going ahead. And that was your statement that it may be unwise to divide the world into autocracies versus democracies and how we divide the world now will be absolutely critical. And you mentioned those who adhere to the rule of law and thereby constrain their power um, versus others who do not recognize that may be um, important. And therefore, both autocrats and monopolists um, may have a similar um, responsibility um, to bear. And uh, the question of how the digital domain is then to be organized uh, may be as uh, a bigger challenge as uh, global taxation. Um, and uh, we very much look forward to interacting with you on these and other domains. But I think this uh, talk about how the world is to be divided will be uh, terribly important and we're really grateful to you for having uh, shared so freely in your thinking. Thank you very much for having come. Yeah, thanks to the both of you and all of you.